Well, let's see, this is episode 30, and uh, in this episode we talk about the third of the three conic sections. We'll talk about hy hyperbolas. Let's go to the first graphic and just recall what, how the three conic sections are, are formed. Um, let's see, you notice that uh, in the double cone on the left, if we cut parallel to the edge, uh, if we cut through the lower cone, we get a parabola. Uh, but if we tilt it just a little bit so that we come out the other side of the double cone, we get an ellipse. And now today, we'll be talking about the hyperbola. Now this is where you cut the double cone steeper, steeper than this inclination. Here we have shown a vertical cut, and you see uh, we're gonna cut both the upper and the lower cone. If we come to the green board, let me just rotate that last figure for uh, 90 degrees. And uh, let's say that this is the double cone that we were just looking at. And rather than cutting it over here on the side, what if I cut it right here in front? And uh, so when I cut through in the front, we're going to get a curve that comes down right about there. And then the other one, the other branch, will be down here. And you can see that in the background we have the edges of the double cone, but then in front we have the two branches of the hyperbola. Okay, so with this introduction, let's go to our list of objectives for today. Let's go to the next graphic. Uh, today we'll be looking at, first of all, the fundamental equations of, a of the hyperbolas. Then we'll look at transformations of hyperbolas, where we shift them uh, off of the origin. And finally, we'll look at the unique uh, reflective property for hyperbolas, just like parabolas and ellipses had a reflective property, so do the hyperbolas. And we'll look at an application. Okay, well, um, you remember that when we were looking at an ellipse, we said, if we go to the green screen, we said that uh, we were going to pick two points on the x-axis. We call these the foci, focus number one and focus number two. And we were going to locate these equidistant from the origin, so we were going to put focus number one at the point C0 and focus number two at the point negative C0. And uh, then we were going to choose points. That, now, this is for the ellipse. We were going to choose points out here on the plane xy so that the sum of the distances to the two fixed points was constant. And we call that the length of our string. You remember we drew an ellipse using a string. And the length of the string, we said, was 2a. Well, the difference now for the hyperbola is that uh, rather than the sum of the distances being 2a, it's the difference of the distances being 2a. So what I'm going to do is choose a point, say, over here, a point xy. And I'll find the distance. Let's take the larger distance over here to f2. And I'll call that distance d2. And the shorter distance, in this case, to f1. And I'll call that distance d1. And this time, I want the difference of the distances to be 2a. Although I could, I could um, put this point xy on either side. And I'll always take the larger distance minus the smaller distance to be 2a. So if I had chosen a point, say, over here, and call this one xy, then I would take the larger distance, this time d1, minus the smaller distance, this time d2, and the difference of the distances is 2a for a hyperbola. OK, so in other words, if I write this down uh, in a more algebraic form, I would say that the absolute value of d2 minus d1 is equal to 2a. I'm putting an absolute value because sometimes the distance d1 is larger than d2, but the absolute value should be 2a. And a hyperbola is the set of all points such that the difference of the distances to the two fixed points, or the foci, is equal to 2a. Uh, let's look at that, at that next graphic, and we'll see this, well, this uh, written out. A hyperbola is the set of points in the plane with the property that the difference of the distances to two fixed points, or the foci, is constant. And we're calling that constant 2a. And the center of the hyperbola is the midpoint between the foci. Uh, now, coming back to the green board, um, if I were to substitute for distance uh, d2, I would put the square root of x plus c squared plus y squared minus, and then for d1, I'll put the square root of x minus c squared plus y squared. That absolute value is equal to 2a. Now, if I square both sides, I could eliminate the absolute values because whether this difference is positive or negative, the square will be the same. So when I square on the left 
and when I square on the right, on the right that's going to be a 4a squared. Now, without going through all the algebraic manipulation that we did last time for the ellipse, uh, let, me just, let me just summarize it by saying if you follow a similar procedure for the hyperbola, um, here's, what, here's what you come to as your final answer. Uh, in this case, you'll get x squared over a squared minus y squared over c squared minus a squared is equal to 1. So th this, is, this is after going through uh, quite a bit of algebra. You can make this equation become this equation. Now, some of the differences between this result and the, and the result that I got with, an ellip with the ellipses is, uh, number one, there's a minus in the middle instead of a plus. Uh, also, this difference in the denominator is a little different. Do you, do you know what's different about that? Do you recognize the difference there? C squared. Yeah, C squared comes first instead yeah. of second. So this is C squared minus A squared rather than the other way around. So when I make my substitution for B squared, you remember for the ellipse, B squared was substituted for A squared minus C squared. Now I'm going to substitute it for um, C squared minus A squared. And if I substitute that into this denominator, I'll just put a, I'll just put a B squared right there, and this is the fundamental equation of a hyperbola if the foci are on the x-axis. Okay, so we've, we've left out quite a bit of the verification in this case to save a little time, but let's go to the next graphic and we'll see a summary of this information. Uh, a hyperbola with foci at plus or minus c, zero, so those are both on the x-axis, and the difference of distances being 2a uh, has the equation x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1, just like we wrote down here, where b squared has been substituted for c squared minus a squared. Now you notice that the difference, uh, that, the, that the center rather, is at the origin. And you notice there are two dotted lines in the background. Those dotted lines represent the sides of the double cone. You see, in this illustration, our double cone is being laid down sideways, and we've cut the double cone in the front, and those dotted lines represent the sides of the double cone. Those are called asymptotes, well, those are asymptotes, like we've seen asymptotes earlier in this course. Uh, and their equations are y equals plus or minus b over a times x. Uh, what we're going to verify that in just a moment. And finally, the eccentricity, e, is still the ratio c over a. But in this, in this situation, c is bigger than a, and therefore the eccentricity will be bigger than 1. Okay, uh, let's come back to the uh, green board and let's talk about those asymptotes for a moment. Now, the fundamental equation of the hyperbola that we're referring to here has the equation x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. And if I draw the graph of it over here, we have foci at c and at negative c on the x-axis. Now, the actual curve of the hyperbola comes in sideways, comes inside of this focus, and turns back out. Same thing on the other side, the hyperbola comes in, this, this branch, they call it, this branch comes in, comes inside the focus, and it turns back out. So it turns out that the foci are actually on the outsides of the hyperbola, whereas on the ellipse, the foci were on the inside of the hyperbola. Now, where does this, where does this hyperbola cross the x-axis? Let's see, it would cross the x-axis when what's zero? When what? <clears throat> when y is zero. When y is zero. Okay, now if you imagine that if I cover up the y term, y is zero, then what we have here is x squared over a squared is equal to one. Our x squared is equal to a squared. Our x is equal to plus or minus a. So it's going to be crossing the x-axis at plus or minus a. That's easy to remember because that's the, that's the square that's underneath the x term. Um, now, is a bigger or smaller than c? Well, you remember in our substitution we have that b squared is equal to c squared minus a squared. That's the substitution we made. And what that tells me is that the c is bigger than the a. And therefore, the intercepts at a and negative a, here's a and here's negative a, these intercepts are inside of the foci, just like we had indicated.
Now, what are the y-intercepts for this hyperbola? Let's see, how do I find y-intercepts? x equal to zero. We're going to set x equal to zero, and when I set x equal to zero, in other words, if I just cover that up, I'm going to get minus y squared over v squared is equal to one. And uh, Stephen, what do you notice about that equation? Um, and it's a negative number is equal to a positive number, which can't happen because yeah, we've got a negative on the left, we have a positive on the right. You see, these squares can't be negative, can they? Because they're squares. And so y squared over b squared can't be negative. And then we put a negative on that, which says it can't be positive. And it's equal to a positive one. So this is impossible. And therefore, there are no y-intercepts. Now, if you go back and think about the graph that you just saw a moment ago, remember the two branches are going like this? So they, they, don't, they don't cross the y-axis. And now we've verified that with the... Um, uh, by, by trying to find the y-intercepts. Okay, now, what about those asymptotes? Well, let's solve this equation for y. Uh, minus y squared over b squared is equal to 1 minus x squared over a squared. And uh, let's multiply both sides by negative 1 to get rid of the negative. y squared over b squared is equal to, now if I multiply this by negative one, I'll just reverse the order because this, this ratio, this rational expression becomes positive and I get x squared over a squared minus one. So that says that y squared is equal to b squared times this. That'll be b squared x squared over a squared minus b squared. And if I write this in a slightly different form, let's get a common denominator the common denominator is a squared, so this will be b squared x squared minus a squared b squared. Okay, now to solve for y, y would be, I'd have to take the square root of this and that'll be the positive and the negative square roots because there's an upper, there's an upper half and a lower half. Uh, square root of, uh, let's see, well let's just rewrite that inside, b squared x squared minus a squared b squared all over a squared. Now, I can simplify this expression a bit if I factor out some square factors. Uh, for example, I could factor out the a squared in the denominator and just put an a out in front. And what can I factor out of the numerator? A b squared. A b squared, so I'll put a b out in front. That's a plus or minus b over a. And then I'm left with a simpler square root um, Susan, what would be under the radical when I factor those out? X squared. Mm hmm yeah. Mm -hmm. Minus, let's see, now we took out the b squares. One. Uh, not one, there, there's an a squared left right here. A. We factored out the common factor of b squared, so there'd be an a squared left. And I have to leave the square on there because it's still under the radical. Okay, now, what I'm thinking is, as, as I follow the graph further and further out here to the right-hand side, the x's are getting bigger, and so are the y's, as a matter of fact. Now, as the x's get bigger, x squared minus a squared, this a squared tends to look relatively small as the x's get really large. And so this, this square root becomes approximately just the square root of x squared, because when x squared gets big, the a squared stays the same. This difference is roughly the same thing as x squared. And so at that moment, this is approximately the same thing as plus or minus b over a times. Now, if this is going to become approximately x squared, the square root of x squared is x. And so to kind of summarize this, I'm saying that as x gets large, that is, if I go far, farther out to the right or if I go farther out to the left, then this graph is approximately plus or minus b over a times x. So if I draw in the line y equals plus or minus b over a times x, the hyperbola will approach that line, and so that becomes an asymptote. Now, let me just erase some of this work, and, and we, can, uh, we can illustrate this further. I'm going to move my graph down to the middle of the screen. so that I can, I can do it better justice by drawing it larger. Um, let's see, now we said that the foci were at plus or minus c. Okay, so here's plus c and minus c. We said that the intercepts were at, let's see, that would be a and 
this would be negative A. And we said that the asymptotes by the discussion there would be plus or minus B over A times X. Now, that says the slope is B over A, so I should go over A up B. Well, now, I've already gone over A right there, so let's go up B. Let's say B is right about here. And so if I go over A and up B, I'll get a point right there, and my asymptote should go, let's see, through the origin, because the, the y-intercept is, is zero. So from the origin through the point um, AB, and just keep right on going, because the slope is B over A. Now, here's what you'll normally see in textbooks, or what most people do. They actually make a little box right here at B, comes down through negative A, goes back through negative B, this is negative B here, and then comes up through positive A. Okay, so this is a dotted box, and its width along the x-axis is 2A, and its height along the y-axis is 2B. And then draw a diagonal line through the corners of that box, and that should go right through the origin. And this is the line y equals b over a times x. That's one of the asymptotes. And then the other line that I draw is also through the box, but it's the other diagonal. I'll draw it this way. And what's the equation of that line? Negative b over a times x. Exactly, y equals negative b over a times x. And I'm drawing those lines in because the hyperbola is going to be approaching those dotted lines as you go out to the, to the right and to the left. Now, we said the x-intercept was at a, so I'm going I'm to actually touch the box right here, and my graph turns and goes out and approaches that asymptote. And on the other side, maybe I should take out my, uh, my little arrow there now, and my graph approaches the asymptote over here. On the other side, a similar thing happens. Uh, it crosses the x-axis at negative a, and this branch goes up and approaches this asymptote, y equals negative b over a, and it approaches the asymptote over here, y equals positive b over a. Now, you notice this is not a parabola that I'm drawing, although you might mistake it for a parabola, but parabolas don't have these diagonal asymptotes that they approach. Parabolas actually turn, if I were going to draw a parabola, the parabola, if it were a parabola, it would actually turn and go out like that, and there's no diagonal line that that would approach. So, uh, it, it has, this graph has some similarities to a parabola, but it's, it's surely not a, a parabola. Okay. Um, Let's see now, you know, the base of this little triangle right here, that was A, and the height of that little triangle was B. Now, I tell you what, can anyone tell me how long is the hypotenuse of this little triangle? Let me just darken the triangle in right there. Root how long A is squared plus B squared? Yeah, that should be A squared plus B squared. Now, you know, we've seen that before because there was a substitution that we made just a few minutes ago and that was that b squared equals c squared minus a squared. Now, if you look at this from another point of view, c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. And so c is the square root of a squared plus b squared. So I think we have something rather, rather relevant here. If the base is a and the height is b, the diagonal is the square root of a squared plus b squared, that's c. This is c right here. It's the diagonal of the triangle sitting in that box. Now, if you had a compass, and if you could open your compass from the origin out to there and just swing that down, if you were to just rotate that down, you would intersect at the focus down below. So the length of that diagonal is the same as the distance out to the focus, which is clearly then bigger than, bigger than a. Yeah, Stephen. I was just looking at your graph of the hyperbola that you drew, uh -huh. and it almost seems like it's um, the equation y equals 1 over x rotated 45 degrees. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when we looked at rational functions, one of our fundamental graphs was f of x equals 1 over x. Let me just write that over here, f of x equals 1 over x. Yeah, this, this is uh, interesting that you say this, because uh, this graph, if you remember, looks sort of like this. This is a hyperbola, 
just like this, but it's been rotated 45 degrees, and those uh, two axes are the two diagonal asymptotes now rotated into the axes. This is a rotated hyperbola, and you'll talk about this in trigonometry, but you have to know a little bit about sines and cosines in trigonometry to explain this aspect. But 1 over x is a rotated hyperbola. Uh, 1 over x squared is not. It has two branches, but you remember it's in the first and the second quadrants. Okay, one more thing to point out in this illustration. Um, I have the two branches of the hyperbola. I have the two dotted lines. And if you think back to that double cone illustration, this is the double cone set sideways. And we've taken a cross section of the double cone out here in front of it, cut through both sides. And the dotted lines actually represent the sides of the double cone behind it. And so as you cut through the double cone, as you go further out, the actual curve approaches the edge of the double cone, although they're actually one is, one is out in front of the other. If you think of this as sort of a three-dimensional illustration, the hyperbola has been shifted out in front a bit, but uh, looking down on it, it appears that the branch of the hyperbola approaches the side of the double cone, even though one's actually above the other. Okay, now let's go to the next graphic and look at what happens if we put the foci on the y-axis. Now, in this case, it says a hyperbola with foci at the points 0, plus or minus c. And once again, the difference of the distances is 2a. Its equation will be y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared is 1. Uh, what is the difference in that equation and the equation that we just saw before? It, at, you know, at first glance, you may say, isn't that the same equation? But there's actually a subtle difference in it. The x's and y's switched. The x's and y's have been interchanged. Yeah, we have x squared, we have y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared. So the way you decide which axis the foci are on is to look at the positive term, y squared, in this case, over a squared. And whatever is the denominator under that positive term, that's the square of the intercepts. So this graph is going to cross the, the y axis at plus or minus a. Uh, once again, the, um, the substitution is b squared equals c squared over a squared. That equation is derived in the very same way as the first equation, which we actually didn't derive. Um, it's derived in the same way and you make the same substitution. Uh, you'll notice there is a difference also in the asymptotes. The asymptotes are now y equals plus or minus a over b. I think in the previous one it was y equals plus or minus b over a. Uh, let's come to the green screen and just discuss this equation for a moment. We have y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared is equal to 1. <coughs> and so what we're going to do here is um, draw our coordinate system. And our foci are at c and uh, negative c. And to find the y-intercepts, to find the y-intercepts here, I let x be 0. So if I cover up the 0, because x is 0, then that says y squared over a squared is 1. Or in other words, y is equal to plus or minus a. So I'll put my, my a here and my negative a right there. And again, I know that a is smaller than c because b squared equals c squared minus a squared. So this number has to be bigger than that number so that I don't get a negative in that case. Um, now, when I go to draw my asymptotes, on, my, on the other axis, I'm going to go out b and negative b, and I'm going to make my little box now. And through those, uh, through those vertices, through those corners, I'm going to draw my asymptotes. There's an asymptote, and um, here's an asymptote. Uh, now, you notice this time the rise is A and the run is B. So, in other words, if I take my A and B out, this is actually A and this is equal to B. And therefore, this is the equation Y equals A over B times X. That's not the same ratio we saw when the foci were on the x-axis. That was B over A before. So there are a few things you have to kind of keep straight about hyperbolas that, um, that we didn't seem to have to take so much time about when we talked about ellipses. The other asymptote is y equals negative a over b 
times x. Uh, once again, what is the length? What is the length of the diagonal in this right triangle? It's going to be c again. Yeah, you see, uh, this this length is going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared, which is c. And therefore, if you take that line segment and just pivot it and rotate it over onto the y-axis, that's where your focus will be. Um, oh, we, we've done everything except draw the hyperbola, haven't we? Okay, here's the hyperbola. It's going to come up this way and turn and go back up that way. And on the other side, it's going to just touch the box, and it's going to come out and approach, approach, but not actually cross the asymptotes there. You know, one of the mistakes that I sometimes see students make is when they go to draw the hyperbola, they have, it, they have the vertex going through the focus, but you see it actually comes up and is tangent to that box and then, and then goes back out. Okay, I think it's time that we actually work some concrete examples here. So let's go to the next graphic and look at, look at three problems that ask us to sketch graphs of these hyperbolas. <coughs> Okay, first of all, we have uh, x squared over 9 minus y squared over 16 is 1. Now, let me ask the class here, what is it that tells you in part A that that's a hyperbola if it hadn't mentioned it in the instructions? I mean, you might say, isn't that, an, an, isn't that one of those ellipses you talked about last time? Well, there's a minus in between the there's two There's a terms. minus instead of a plus, yeah. So, in that first equation, uh, you notice it's in the form x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is one. So already this tells me which axis the foci are on. You see the positive term here is the x term. So the foci are on the x-axis. Okay, so I, I know that the branches will be opening to the left and to the right. Furthermore, looking at this, this tells me that a squared is nine, so a is equal to three, and it tells me b squared is uh, 16, so b is equal to four. And you say, wait a minute, you've got a smaller than b. Well, you know, for ellipses, a was always bigger than b. But for hyperbolas, a and b can have any relationship. The, the number that's the biggest is always c, is always the focus number when you're talking about hyperbolas. While we're at it, let's go ahead and calculate c. Uh, b squared is equal to c squared minus a squared. And so 16 is equal to c squared minus 9. And so c squared is equal to 25, and therefore c is equal to 5. I'm taking the positive square root here because a, b, and c are always taken to be positive. So now we know a, we know b, and we know c. Let me just add that to my list up here. c is equal to 5, and I think we're ready to draw the graph. And the graph will look like this. Um, I'm going to go out uh, 5 units to locate the focus. Okay, so there's focus number one, that's it, that's at C, and I'll go at five units in the other direction, and that'll be, that'll be focus number, number two, right here and right here. Uh, but while I'm at it, I'll go out three units to locate my uh, x-intercepts at three and at negative three. And uh, I want to draw my box to locate my asymptotes, so I'm going to go up and down four. One, two, three, four. And one, two, three, four. And I'll make my box right here. And you remember that the dimensions of the box are 2a and 2b. And I'll draw the asymptotes through here. Whoops, I missed that one. Let's just make it bend a little bit. Sort of artistic license, you might say. And now my hyperbola branches open left and right, and I start right at the box at that intercept, and, and the first branch comes up like this, and it comes down like that, and the other branch looks like this. Okay, and that's the graph of x squared over 9, minus uh, y squared over 16 equals 1. You know, something I, I failed to mention earlier is that the axis that you place the foci on, uh, when we talked about ellipses, that was called the major axis. Uh, when you talk about hyperbolas, this is referred to as the transverse axis. Don't ask me why. Uh, it has a different name. I can see why you would want to, let me move that over a little bit so you can read that. 
I'll write it on this side. This is the transverse axis. That's the axis that the foci are on. And the other axis, the axis that the hyperbola doesn't cross, is referred to as the conjugate axis. The conjugate axis. Whereas if this had been an ellipse, that would be called the minor axis, the major and the minor axis. For hyperbolas, there's a different vocabulary, so it makes it a little bit confusing. Uh, let's, go to, let's go to B, problem B. And uh, this one <coughs> is written in a different form. We have uh, 4y squared minus 36x squared is 36. This is not in standard form. This is what we call standard form up here where I have a 1 on the right. What should I do to this equation in B to put it in standard form? Divide everything by 36. Divide by 36. Okay, so that's going to be, um, let's see, 4y squared over 36 minus 36 x squared over 36 is equal to 1. 36 over 36 or 1. So this becomes y squared over 9 minus x squared over 1, or if you prefer, just say x squared is equal to 1. Uh, now, which, which axis is the transverse axis, or the, the axis on which the foci lie? The y-axis. On the y-axis, because that's the term that's positive. And that also identifies a. a is equal to 3, because a squared is 9. Uh, b squared is 1, and so b is equal to 1. And c is equal to, well, I'll have to use my identity, b squared equals c squared minus a squared. And so 1 is equal to c squared minus 9. It looks like c squared is equal to 10. So what is c going to equal? Square root of 10. Square root of 10. Okay, I'll just fill that one in right here, square root of 10. Okay, so when I go to draw my graph, we know a is, uh, a is 3, b is 1, c is the square root of 10. Let me just record that over here on the side to make a little room. Uh, a is 3, b is 1, c is the square root of 10. Now, let's draw a graph right below this. And uh, I'm going to be locating my foci on the positive uh, y, on the, on the y-axis. So I'll go up 3, so I'll, and I'll go down 3. And then from the origin, I'll go over 1, and I'll go back 1, and that's where I'll make my box, right there. I'm leaving out a few tick marks on the axes to kind of speed things along. And then I'll draw my asymptotes through there. Now, these asymptotes are fairly steep. And therefore, the hyperbola looks like this. And you see the asymptotes have come closer together. They're both steeper. And uh, so I tend to get a rather thin-looking hyperbola, but I still approach those asymptotes just like, just like before. Um, can anyone tell me the length of the diagonal along here? The length of that diagonal? Root 10. It's the square root of 10 because it's the value of c. And you see, if I rotate that, if I rotate that over onto the y-axis, I would get a point right about there. That's where the focus is. If the focus and the, the intercepts uh, these are called vertices. If the focus and the vertices are close together, you tend to get a rather thin hyperbola. If the focus is further away from the intercepts, you tend to get a wider, a wider hyperbola in that case. Okay, there's one more example on this screen. Let's just uh, look at it quickly. Um, we have x squared over 16. Let's go back to that screen that we just had up there. There was one more example we wanted to work. Here we go. Uh, x squared, 16x squared minus 25y squared is negative 100. Now, because the x squared is positive, you would think that the foci are on the x-axis, but I don't think that's the case. The foci are not on the x-axis. Why not? Because we're going to have to divide by a negative to... Yeah. You see, I've, I, I've, I've tried to hide the axis that is the transverse axis by putting a negative on the 100. And a lot of times in textbooks, they'll put a negative over here to take your attention uh, away from the fact that this term is positive, but that's actually not the axis that is the major or the transverse axis. If I divide by negative 100, this guy becomes positive. That's going to be y squared over 4. And uh, this term becomes negative. That's going to be 16 over 100 or 4 over 25, 4x squared over 25. 
And then if I divide by negative 100, this will be a 1. Now, we, we faced this problem when we talked about ellipsis, too. What do you do when there's a 4 in the numerator? That's not in what you'd call standard form. What should we do? Divide the denominator by 4 and as well as the numerator. Exactly, right. So we're going to divide top and bottom by 4. And this is y squared over 4 minus x squared over 25 fourths is equal to 1. Now, this tells me a lot of information. It tells me, first of all, that the y-axis is the transverse axis. So this hyperbola opens up and down. It also tells me that a squared is 4, so a is 2, because a squared is always the denominator under the positive or in the positive term. It tells me that b is 5 halves, because b is always the denominator of the other term, which is the conjugate axis. And finally, c is equal to, well, we have to work that one out. b squared is equal to c squared minus a squared. So 25 fourths is equal to c squared minus 4. So c squared is equal to 25 over 4 plus 4. How many fourths will that be when you add those together? 41. 41 fourths. Yeah, it's kind of awkward. 41 fourths. So c is the square root of that. C is the square root of 41 all over, all over 2. Okay, now, uh, let's, try, let's try going back. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put my information over here, and I'll open a space for us to uh, draw our graph. 5 halves, and C is the square root of 41 over 2. Now, let's come over here and draw the graph of this hyperbola. And I'm going to go up two units and down two units. I'm going to go over two and a half units and two and a half units. And I'll make my box right there parallel to the conjugate and parallel to the transverse axes. Okay, here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. So my asymptotes come through here. And my hyperbola has a branch that opens out to the, to the, uh, oh, let's see, nope. Yeah, I, I, I plugged to the wrong place, right? Remember, the y-axis is the transverse axis, so I need to put that, those vertices right here, and the branches open up. Thank you, Stephen, for, for I didn't draw the graph too readily, too quickly. And the hyperbola looks like this. Now, we have just graphed the hyperbola 16x squared, minus 25y squared is equal to negative 100. Yeah, that's what we're graphing over here. We're graphing this hyperbola, um, and it opens up and down like that. Okay, let's go to the next example. This problem says find the equation of the hyperbola with intercepts 0 plus or minus 2 squared to 3 and asymptotes y equals... Uh, y equals one half, plus or minus one half x. Now, you'll have a lot of problems similar to this in your homework. You're supposed to find the equation of that hyperbola, and you're given some information about it. In this case, we're given the intercepts and the asymptotes. In a different situation, you could be given the, um, you could be given the foci, and you could be given, say, the length of the transverse axis. Now, when they say the length of the transverse axis, they mean the distance between the two foci. Okay, well, in this case, we're given that the intercepts, first of all, are on the y-axis. So I know that the equation should be of the form y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared is equal to 1. Uh, furthermore, I know the value of a because a is, uh, it looks like kind of a comma there. I don't think that should be a comma. That's 2 times the square root of 3. Okay, so we know that a is equal to 2 times the square root of 3. And I know that the ratio, either a over b or b over a, is one half. Now let's see when we're when we have uh, our our intercepts, our vertices on the y-axis. Is this ratio a over b, or is that b over a? A over b is a over b. Okay. So uh, the ratio of a over b is the same as one over two. Uh, if the if the, uh, if the foci and the intercepts had been on the x-axis, this ratio would be b over a. 
And I know that a is 2 times the square root of 3. So this allows me to solve for b. And if I cross multiply, b is equal to uh, 4 times the square root of 3. So let's add that to our list up here. b is equal to 4 times the square root of 3. But that allows me to write down these equations. y squared over a squared. Well, now, what is this number squared? What is a squared? You have to square the 2 and square the square root. If you square the 2, you get 4. And if you square the square root, you get 3. 4 times 3 is 12. So this denominator is 12 minus b squared. Now, let's see. To get, here's b. So b squared would be, let's see, 4 squared times the square root of 3 squared. That'll be 16 times 3 is how much? 50. Let's see, 16 times 3? Um, 48. Yeah, 48. Yeah, thank you. 48 is equal to 1. Now, this problem said find the equation of hyperbola, and this is the equation of that hyperbola. Now, we could do other things. We could find the foci. We could draw the graph of it and so forth, but this problem didn't ask us to do that. So let's move on to a different, a different uh, example. Okay, what's the next example we have here? Um, in this next problem, we have three very similar looking equations, and it says sketch each one of these conics. Now, these are not all, all hyperbolas. Which one of those is not a hyperbola? The last one. The last one, yeah. And what is it, uh, Jeff? It's an ellipse because we, have, uh, we have a plus. These others have a minus. Now, this says to sketch all three of these conics. You notice the terms are all the same, x squared over 4, x squared over 4, x squared over 4 etc. One's over here on the right hand side. I'm going to draw these all on the same coordinate system and let's compare what they look like. So um, let's take this first, let's, let's take this first hyperbola. What's the value of a in the first hyperbola? Two. Is equal to two and what's the, what's the transverse or the major axis? The x-axis. The x-axis. So I'm going to go out two on the x-axis. And the conjugate axis is the y-axis, and I'll go up and down 1. So I'll go up and down 1, and this is negative 1, and I'll make my little box right there to set up drawing my hyperbola. And this allows me to set up the asymptotes. Okay, there's one asymptote. This is the line y equals 1 half x, and here's another asymptote. And this is the line y equals negative 1 half x. And when I draw the hyperbola, uh, I will just touch the box right there at this vertex, and it'll turn and go out. And over here, it'll turn and go down. And on the other side, at negative 2, it looks like this. OK, so let's just keep in mind that on this particular graph, uh, a was equal to 2, b was equal to 1. Okay, now in the second graph, this is a hyperbola. Which axis, which axis is the transverse axis? The y-axis. The y-axis. And what's the value of a in this problem? 1. a is 1. Okay, a is 1. So I go up 1 on the y-axis. I go up 1 on the y-axis. There we have it. And I'll have a vertex right there. And, uh, oh, also at negative 1. Better put two of those in. And the conjugate axis, or the minor axis, is the x-axis. And on that axis, I should go out 2. So in this case, b is 2. I go out 2 units. So you notice I'm going to get the same box, but technically the values of a and b have switched because a is now 1 and before a was 2. And my hyperbola is going to look like this. It's going to be a very wide hyperbola. And it's just the one that fills in the other side of the asymptotes. Now let's look at how this came about. I started off with x squared over 4 minus y squared over 1 is 1. And if you switch the two terms, you get, you get the other hyperbola on the other side of the asymptotes. This is referred to as the conjugate hyperbola. So I have this hyperbola, and I have this conjugate hyperbola. And they have the same asymptotes, the same box, but they have the opposite transverse and conjugate axes, and they have the opposite values for a and b. 
Now finally, what if I put a plus in here? This is an ellipse. Where does this ellipse cross the x-axis? At x equals 2 and negative 2. 2 and negative 2. Okay, so it crosses the x-axis here and here. It crosses the y-axis at plus or minus 1 here and here. And if I draw an ellipse, the ellipse is inside the box. And it's just tangent at the four, on the four sides. So if you put a plus in the middle, it doesn't matter in which order those terms are, because when you put a plus in, you can add them in either order, you get the ellipse inside the box. So it's rather curious how closely knit these graphs are. I have a hyperbola, I have the conjugate of the hyperbola, and then I have the ellipse inside the box that I used to draw the asymptotes. So I think that's an interesting relationship that we have. Okay, next graphic. Here we have an example of a hyperbola that's been shifted off of the origin. It has a, has a translation in it, but I've multiplied out the terms so we can't tell how it's been translated. We've seen problems like this before when we talked about ellipses. I'm just going to write this one here on the green screen so that I can work it out. Um, 9x squared minus 16y squared minus 72x minus 32y minus 16 is 0. Um, can anyone tell me what you think the first step is going to be here to determine the center of this hyperbola? Group-like group -like group terms and for group what the purpose? Group the terms so that you can complete the square. Right, right. We're going to have to complete the square. Um, what tells me this will be a hyperbola is you notice that the two terms that are squared, there's a minus in there. If, this had, if there had been a plus in here, I would think this would be an ellipse. But because there's a difference of the squares, then I'm thinking it's probably going to be of this form x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is 1. Because here's a minus of squares, a difference of squares, and here's a difference of squares, and it's in the same order. So I want to make that look to, I want to put that in this, in this form. Okay, so Stephen says group the terms, group the x's and group the y's. So we have 9x squared minus 72x uh, squared minus, I'll factor out the minus, and then 16y squared and plus 32y, because I'm factoring out the minus. And the 16, the negative 16, which is sort of a tag along, I'll just put on the, on the other side 16 over there. Now, what do I need to do before I complete the square here? Uh, Susan, what, what do you see is going to have to be done? Find a constant. Uh, well, we have to find the constant, but uh, there's a problem out. here. David? Yeah, take out. Uh, 9. Take out the 9, nine take out the 16. 16, yeah. We have to get this down to a, a, a coefficient of 1. Mm -hmm. So this would be 9 times x squared minus 8x, and then minus 16 times y squared plus 2y. And nothing's happening over on the right that's still just a 16. Okay, I need to add a constant here to complete the square. And uh, let's see, the rule says once you have a 1 on the square term, you take half this and square it. So let's see, half a negative 8 is negative 4, so I'll add 16. And over here, I need to add 16. Times 9. Oh, times, yeah, nine. times oh, 9. Yeah, thank you very right. much. Of course, times 9. That's, <laughs> that's, that's something I wanted to point out that students frequently overlook, and now I've overlooked it. <laughs> see, I put in 9 of 16s, not just 1. So over here, I need to be adding on 144. That's 9 times 16. And uh, in this term, let's see, half of 2 is 1, so when I square it, I get a 1. I'm actually adding on a negative 16 there, so over here, I'll have to add on a negative 16. So this gives me 9 times x minus 4 squared minus 16 times y plus 1 squared equals, and if I total all this up, the 16s cancel, that's 144. Okay. Now, this is still not in standard form. What do I need to do now? Divide by 144. Divide by 144, yeah. So that's going to be a 1. Uh, now, you know, let me just make a note over here to kind of speed these things along. 144 is 9 times 16. So when I divide by 144 here, the 9 cancels, but the 16 is left. So this is x minus 4 squared over 16, because the 9 canceled off. And in this case, the 16 cancels, and I'm left with a 9. So this is my hyperbola in standard form, except I can see the shift. What shift is being made here? To the right 
Four. To the right, four. And what shift's being made here? Down, Down one. one. Uh, up one, actually, sure. because... Oh, I'm sorry. Down one, of course. Down one. There's a plus. So I've got to go down. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And so now let's draw that graph. Okay, so uh, what I've done here is to move the problem up to give me a little room to draw the graph. Let's come back to the green screen. And uh, let's see now. The center of this hyperbola is going to be at the point 4, negative 1. 4, negative 1. Now, this is the center. You know, all of the graphs we've drawn so far have been centered at the origin. This, was now centered, this is now shifted off center. Uh, A is equal to 4, and B is equal to 3. So if I go over 4 more, that's going to be my transverse axis intercept on the right. And if I go back 4, that'll put me right here. That's my transverse axis intercept on the left. Now, to make my asymptotic box, I'm going to go up 3, and I'm going to go down 3, right here. And now, here is the box that I'll use to draw the asymptotes. OK, we've got the center. You know, maybe I shouldn't call it C, because we use C for focus, so I'll just eliminate that. And my asymptote comes through here, and the other asymptote comes through like this. Now, when I draw my hyperbola, will I be drawing the upper and lower branches or left and right branches? Left and right. Left and right, exactly. And here's my vertex. So at that point, my graph turns and goes out and approaches those asymptotes, that asymptote, and it comes down like this. And on the other side, it turns and approaches asymptotes on either side. Um, are there any questions about that? Let me ask you this. How long is the um, how long is this diagonal? How long is the diagonal right there? This was five. four, this was three, this is five. So what that tells me is the focus, instead of going over four, the focus I should go over five. You get a focus there, and if I go back five, I'll get a focus uh, right here. Let me ask you another question. If I had drawn in the hyperbola that had a branch above and below, what would have been its equation? y plus 1 squared over 9 yeah. minus mm -hmm. x minus 4 squared over 16 right. equals, equals 1. Equals 1, of course. All you do is just reverse those terms. And by the way, if I drew the ellipse that's inside this box, what would be its equation? x minus 4 squared over 16 plus, plus. Y, y plus 1 squared over 9 equals 1. Exactly. So you just put a plus, a plus in there, and now you have the ellipse inside the box. OK, very good. Now we have one application. Uh, that I wanted to mention here before we run out of time. I think this is kind of an interesting one. It sort of sets up a, a sort of a sort of a mystery. Can we go to the next graphic? Okay, Bill says, Ted, what was that? Ted says, a gunshot. Now, Ted and Bill are standing a thousand feet apart. Assume Bill hears the shot one second after Ted hears the shot. Show that the gunshot occurred somewhere along a branch of this hyperbola. And there's a hint that the speed of sound is about 800 feet per second. OK, let me just show you how we could solve that problem uh, here on a coordinate system. Let's say we put uh, Ted and Bill on the x-axis. I'm going to put Ted over here, and I'll put Bill over here. And they're 1,000 feet apart, so that makes this uh, the point 500, 0, and this is the point negative 500, 0. Okay, now, Ted, here's the shot before Bill does, so it sounds like the shot should be somewhere over on this side of the graph, uh, on this side of the coordinate system. Now, let's say the gunshot took place right here. The sound travels to Ted, and the sound travels to Bill, but it takes longer to get to Bill. In fact, it takes one second longer. Now, if sound travels at 800 feet per second, uh, then how much further away does, or how much further does the sound travel to get to Bill than to Ted if it took one extra second? Well, it would have to take 800, it would travel 800 extra feet, because in one second it'll travel 800 feet. So what that tells me is 2A is equal to 800. Because remember, 2a was the uh, difference 
in the distances. And if I think of these as being foci, then I have that C is equal to 500 and A is equal to 400, A here being 400. And if I know A and C, I can calculate B squared. B squared is C squared minus A squared. So C squared is 25, 250,000. You know, when you square a number that ends in zeros, you just double the number of zeros. So it's 25 and four zeros. And the same thing for A squared, that'll be 16 with uh, four zeros. And therefore, that difference is a nine with four zeros. That's gonna be 90,000. So therefore, if, uh, if I have Ted and Bill as the two fixed points, and the fixed difference of distance is 800, then this must be the equation x squared over a squared, which is 250,000, minus y squared over b squared, which is 90,000, is equal to one. That's a hyperbola, and this hyperbola comes in like so. I'll leave out the asymptotes here in the interest of time. And it's, so the gunshot took place on one branch of a hyperbola, and this is the hyperbola that we were, that we were given in that problem. Okay, uh, now one other thing about the reflective property of hyperbola, we just have a few seconds left, but let me just mention that if the hyperbola looks like, looks like this, and if the foci are here, then if, uh, if you have light coming in toward one focus, it's reflected to the other focus point if this is a reflective surface. Now, if this is a reflective surface, this will be reflected back to the other focus. And so it goes. The light just keeps being reflected back and forth toward one focus and then toward another. Well, you know, I, th I think we're just about out of time. So uh, we have just finished the three conic sections. Uh, next time in episode 31, we'll talk about sequences and series, and I'll see you then.